The following program, DuCoin State Fair Memories, was produced as an official event of the Illinois Bicentennial Commission in cooperation with the Illinois Department of Agriculture. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm Jack Titchener from WSIU Public Broadcasting, and welcome to DuCoin State Fair Memories. It's a look at the DuCoin State Fair, the 96th edition of the fair, coinciding with the 200th anniversary of Illinois State House, uh, the statehood. It's Constitution Day as we celebrate the Illinois Bicentennial. I want to say uh, thanks at the beginning to all the fair staff and the Department of Agriculture for making all this possible with all the logistics and all the arrangements. We're joined today by three people today who have become very good friends of ours, and their lives are very closely linked with the DuCoin State Fair. Cousins Jane Hayes Rader, Carol Hayes Hill, granddaughters of W.R. Hayes, who started the DuCoin State Fair. Jane's father, Gene, and Carol's father, Don, were central to the fair's success over the decades as home to the prestigious Hamiltonian Harness Race, a major entertainment venue for the stars of radio, television, uh, stage, and film. Fred Huff, of course, who many of us know from his years as SIU Sports Information Director and Assistant uh, Director of Athletics at SIU. He managed the Ducoin State Fair for seven years in the 70s and has authored an extensive history of the fair. Jane, Carol, and Fred have uh, helped us put together a wide variety of archival footage that you're seeing on the screens there and photographs. Uh, WSIU is recording today's uh, event and we'll be turning it into a special broadcast later this fall about the uh, fair. I'm going to start with uh, Jane and Carol. Let's start at the very beginning. Everything you see here is a result of your grandfather's dream of organizing a state fair here in the heart of Southern Illinois. What was his inspiration for that? Well, I wasn't born when he started it. <laughs> but I was here 10 years after he started it. And I recall vividly spending a lot of time with him. I was the oldest first grandchild. And I remember being picked up in the car in the evening by him and my grandmother and Moody. And we roamed those hills and he figured where each tree would be planted and what kind of tree it would be. He was trying to make this a park, but he already had that half mile track and that wooden grandstand just as you come in because he was a lover of horses and horse racing was key to him, and he wanted uh, a venue to show horse racing. Um, that got into our blood, all of us. We all love horses, and he was the beginning of it. Everybody tells me that he went to the World's Fair in St. Louis with his mother and his sisters, and that probably a bug was planted then. He was a showman at heart. And I suspect that had a lot to do with his saying, I'm going to go home to my hometown and I'm going to start something like that. He was interested in harness racing from the very beginning, wasn't he? He was. The story is he bought his first horse in Kentucky and rode with it in a boxcar all the way back to DuCoin. Wow. <laughs> and of course, this is all possible because of him starting out in the soft drink business as, as a kid. His, his father was killed in a coal mine accident, as I understand, and uh, his mother, to help the kids uh, keep the family going, uh, was, uh, started bottling soda water here in town, and later uh, he ended up with the Coca-Cola franchise. That's right. He started peddling it in a cart when he was 12 years old, and it grew from that. Carol, you also grew up here on the fairgrounds, right? Yes, I did. Tell us about growing up here at, at DuCoin. Well, growing up out here in the fairgrounds was fabulous. I mean, how many kids can grow up with a carnival in their backyard for 10 days? It was, I had a blast as a kid out here growing up because I went everywhere and did everything. But it was also great growing up the other 51 weeks out of the year. I had a bicycle, I rode all over the fairgrounds. If mom needed me, she had one of those huge black bells that I still have in the backyard. She'd ring it, I could hear it all over the fairgrounds. I'd hop on my bicycle and come right home. 
Sometimes you might have to ring it two or three times, but I always got here. <laughs> And Fred, uh, you of course have been coming to the fair, and you grew up around it as well. I think the first story you wrote for the DuCoin Evening Call was about that old grandstand burning down in 1945, is that right? That is correct. It's probably one of the poorest stories that ever appeared in the DuCoin Evening Call because it was the first news story I ever wrote in my life. I was 16 years old at the time, and the only reason I even got forced or into writing the story was Virgil Bishop, who's the editor, took one of his rare days off that day, and there wasn't anyone else around. Uh, the fire started shortly before noon. I was home having lunch at the time. I got a phone call from Mr. Smith, who is a publisher. He said, get out there and find out what the hell's going on. So I came out and saw the grandstand was practically burned down then. It was just a wooden structure didn't take long to burn it down, but um, I did manage to get about a, a six, seven inch story out, that, which I didn't have enough courage to look at the story for about five years because I knew it must have been awful, and it was. But uh, yeah, that was my start, but that was the only bad thing that ever happened out here as far as I'm concerned. This is a great institution and a great happening, one of the finest that's ever taken place in the state of Illinois. I guess that's my opinion. When did you start uh, coming out to the fair, Fred, and starting to take uh, part in the activities here? Well, my first really, I, I ushered in the grandstand before it burned down. Uh, Mr. Hayes gave me a, a quarter tip for dusting on the seat. That's beside the point. I really started working when I was um, uh, about 17 or 18 years old, and no, I was older, about, about 20 years old, and. And when Frank Samuel, so a lot of people may remember Frank Samuel's name. He at one time was the mayor of Carterville. I think he was a school teacher at Carterville. He also worked for WJPF. And Frank was a PR director out here at the time, and a good one. The only thing Frank did not do was write. And uh, once he found out, I knew a little bit something about writing. This was, I was a little bit older, but then um, he hired me to do his writing. And uh, so that was, that was my real start. That was probably in about 1960 after I'd taken a job down at SIU. And uh, I worked um, four hours a day up here, then got in a car and went down to SIU and worked the rest of the day and early night at SIU. But uh, it's been a great start, it's a great run. Well, you, you literally wrote the book about the fair, no question about that. It's full of great information over the years of history. I want to talk a little bit more and ask a little bit more about the history of horse racing here. Uh, of course, the fair is known for harness racing, but there were also show horses here. Uh, tell us, tell us, can you break it down between your dad was in, your dad uh, Gene was interested in the harness racing, and your dad Don did a lot of work with the show horses. Is that right? Yes, mom and dad showed three and five gated saddlebred horses back in the late 30s through most of the 40s. But I think they got outvoted because the rest of the family went to racehorses. So they converted over to that and dad drove and trained and then it was all standard breads. The, the Society Horse Show was a big deal. It was at night on an oval right at the end of here. And it was a beautiful spectacle. And, ho and show horses were big then. A lot of Southern Illinois people had them and showed them and they rode three, the gated ones, but they also drove them to sulkies. And um, Virginia Marmaduke came down from Chicago with great regularity. She was a very good friend of Carol's folks. And she was the MC and Jack Stalkup's band played. And, it was the place to be at night around here. In terms of uh, harness racing, what was your dad Gene's role as a professional? Who He was a, an official in a lot of the organizations that uh, oversaw the, the sport in this country. Yes, he grew up loving horse racing and helping them train. My dad was a large man. He was 6'4 and, and big. He was a little bit much to ask horses to haul around the track, <laughs> albeit he did drive in some amateur races and did very well. He won one here, I remember one time. Um, he just loved it, as did his dad. 
and he did get involved. And when the Grand Circuit came to do coin in 57, he was on the board of the Grand Circuit. He was on the Hamiltonian board. He was um, the first chairman of the Illinois Harness Racing Commission. He was very respected in that industry all over the country, not just in Illinois. And Carol, your, your brother Don raced horses as well? He was a harness racer? Yes, he raced for a few years for the stables for Hayes Fair Acres. He was very successful with a horse by the name of Desert Wind. He run, won a lot of races. I really don't remember how many years he did race, but he was a successful driver. You know, we were talking about the uh, the old grandstand that burned in 1945. How quickly did the new grandstand come together? Of course, this is uh, right at the end of World War II. It's hard to get materials to build things, but this came together fairly quickly, didn't it? The two houses had just been built. The big barn was built at that same time, and so was the grandstand started. And I well remember the day that old wooden grandstand burned and what a, it was in the middle of July and here the fair was coming up six weeks later. They were able to get a tent over the top of that shell and get um, a lot of chairs in there and use that that very next year. And the track was already in place. That would, of course, that was the key. But the track was there and in shape, and they made that grandstand usable and then actually finished the construction before the next fair. And you see additional grandstands on either side of that for car racing and for horse racing when the Hamiltonian came to Ducoin. All three of those stands were filled on race day. It was a beautiful thing to see. <coughs> The hazes were, um, you might say, fairly good and adept at uh, causing things to happen. And uh, Mr. Hayes brought in an army of craftsmen, carpenters, bricklayers, cement finishers, and they got the, as I understand it and what I've read, the patio was already in place, much of it patio. And the plans, of course, was that they move the fair to the, where it pre presently is, to the, uh, to, to the mile track the following year, but uh, certainly not within the next five to six weeks. And that's what happened. In five to six weeks' time, I think the, the fair, the grandstand at the old half-mile track burned on July 16th. And they had a fair, and they set people in the grandstand that you now see six weeks later, not the the orchestra seats were not in place, and the seats in the upper grandstand were merely folding chairs. They didn't have the seats that you see there now and that have been there for the last 40 or 50 years, but they, they had folding chairs in the upper grandstand, and they managed to, to put on the night shows there quite well. Of course, the, the two bleachers on the, each side of the grandstand were not there. They didn't need them back in those days. But uh, they did a remarkable job, miraculous job, and in the fair was, as you might imagine, a lot of people came out just to see the, the new grandstand. And it was, as always, the Decoin State Fair has been one of the most successful, one of the most well-attended events ever in Southern Illinois. Some of my friends down south don't like for me to say this, but I've said it and written it several times. The Decoin State Fair attracts more people and has for every year, for years and years and years. They've attracted more people than the football and basketball seasons put together at SIU. And I don't know if the people here have any more fun. It all depends on how successful the football and basketball teams are. But um, that's beside the point. The, the grandstand is great. It was two years in its total completion before they, they got the restrooms in place and before they, they managed to, to put permanent seating in the upper grandstand. But it was a miraculous job that they did, and uh, the Hayes is just one of the many things that they need to be congratulated, congratulated for having done so successfully in their lives. Now, I remember being told stories way back at the end of the war where Grandpa would have trains 
come in in the middle of the night full of supplies for the grandstand construction. They'd unload them in the darkness of night to help get the grandstand built. I believe almost anything along that line that you told me, because it, well, you just can't imagine building a grandstand the size. There again, it was not quite as large as it is today, but putting a structure together like that in five to six weeks' time is miraculous. And uh, that's what they did. That's what they accomplished. It's a beautiful building, and it's just a, an architectural jewel. There was another jewel box of a building here just to our south, the, the Midwest stables and later the Hayes family stables, oh, about two football fields long, two stories high with a rotunda and a terrazzo floor. Tell us about that. It was 500 feet long, and it had 180 stalls in it, which gives you an idea of the size. It was a fabulous building. The rotunda of the barn had a terrazzo floor. They used to stand the sulkies up around the edges of the center motif. And then the stalls were all wooden and finished in a circular motion. I used to play in there a whole lot when I was little. You could go upstairs and there were holes over each stall where they'd throw the hay down to the horses. It was a, it was a phenomenal building. Yeah, that, One miraculous thing is red it? barns are here on the south end. Those were provided after the that big barn burned to the ground. That's 1970. Yes, I yes. think. 1970. And there were again, no horses in it, fortunately. Yeah. Luckily. It was shortly before the fair. It was the middle of the summer. And uh, the war, the war years, 1940s, also had a role in Ducoin becoming a, a scene for the Grand Circuit. As I understand, Springfield, because of the war effort, the state fair up there had dates, but they closed the fairgrounds because they were using it for military operations. So those races came down to DuCoin, is that right? And that's how we became a part of the Grand Circuit. And that's a string of outstanding fairs. It was Springfield, now then Springfield and DuCoin. It was Indianapolis, it was Lexington, Kentucky. It was Sedalia, Missouri for a long time. And, and then Eastern tracks. But that track was rated the number one fastest track in America. There's no, no question why they call it the Magic Mile. The it's, magic an amazing, mile. it's an amazing facility still to this day. Um, what roles did, did Gene and Don play in running the fair and the harness racing here before your grandfather passed away in 1952? How did, how did the, the brothers step up and manage the operations here? Well, you know, I don't ever remember seeing my grandfather trackside on race day. He was roaming in the grandstands and was around. My dad was always trackside. And so was Don, once he was through with doing the horse show. They both were always trackside and in charge of what went on there. I'll tell you how important it was to my family. My mother decreed that if my dad was gonna put on first class racing over there, we should be in our seats for every single heat. And one day, my sister-in-law and I lingered a little long at the tennis court and we missed the first two heats. And she glared at us. And we got the message, we never did that again. We were there for every heat, every day. That's the way I grew up, and I'm still compelled to do that. I feel like I'm gonna get in trouble if I'm not there, <laughs> which is not true. But it was that big. Our house was full of horse people all the time. Uh, a lot of Wonderful entertaining went on. Always a lovely garden party before the Hamiltonian. Uh, nice dinners at night, but noon was get something quick because you got to get over there by one o'clock when the first race goes. So at my house, there was always a cooler of Coca-Cola in the basement. You could get to that pretty fast. Then we'd do a head count and somebody would run down the end of the driveway, turn right to John and Ethel's barbecue and get as many barbecues as there were heads in the house, and often it was 12 or more. We'd have a barbecue and a Coke before we raced off to the first race. That was tradition. 
many we had the same tradition at our house. Yeah. Too. And Except I'm the one that went and got the barbecues. <laughs> well, but you knew where you were supposed to be. When? Yeah. Yes, we did. And I went to the night show every single night. It was the same show normally for five nights, and then a change on weekends, and Labor Day was always different. One year, there was a, an act there called Ben Blue. He was an old vaudevillian type and comedian. He brought a troupe of about six people, and they did a routine. One night, he was in our basement, and my good friend Barbara and I said, oh, we just love your show, Ben. It's so good, and we've been there every night. He said, well, you probably got it down. We said, yeah, we do. He said, why don't you just come on stage with us tomorrow night? Well, okay, we did. I still remember the look on my dad's face when I marched out on that stage. It was, we are not paying you to perform, Jane. Get back in the crowd. He didn't say that, and he let us do it, and we loved it. We thought we were big time showbiz. Now, the, in 1950, your horse, Lusty Song, won the Hambletonian race. He did. That was, was your he, that was your grandfather's great dream, wasn't it? It was. And it was still in Goshen, New York at the time. But my grandfather and grandmother were there, and so was I, and so was my brother and my folks. And later that year, our pacing horse, Dudley Hanover, won the Little Brown Jug, which was the premier pacing race that was held in Delaware, Ohio. So to win them both in the same year, I think is unprecedented. I don't think the same stable has done that since. How did the Hambletonian come to be located in Ducoin in 1957? Well, it had been in Goshen most of the time. And the board that was in charge of that race were mostly Eastern businessmen. And that's where they wanted to keep it. But there were problems. The track had gotten out of shape. It wasn't very good. They weren't getting good miles. There was a move to move it, and some other tracks bid on it. But by power of persuasion, I guess, my dad and later Don uh, were able to convince them that this was the place to have it. And I, th I remember the first year all those fancy Easterners came here. It was with a look of, oh my, what have we gotten into? This is in the middle of the cornfield. They had so much fun and were treated so nicely that they couldn't wait for the next year to come back. Their horses had lovely places to stay. The track was pristine. They got good records on their horses. They were entertained. There wasn't much not to like. <laughs> Carol, you saw a lot of, you were at a lot of those parties. What was it like to rub shoulders with the uh, society people from the East Coast and around the country? Well, I was young enough when it first started that I didn't rub too many shoulders. I was, I was too busy doing other things. But underfoot. Yeah, I was underfoot at that time. <laughs> but I met a lot of the entertainers, of course, that were there. I had one sing to me in our basement. Debbie Reynolds sang Tammy to me after I hounded her enough to please do so. I met all the entertainers that were there over the years and got autographs. It was, it was great growing up out here. I can't say enough good stuff about it. I think getting back to the Hamiltonian coming here, I, I've got to mention one guy's name who, in my opinion, of course, I'm a little prejudiced about some things, but my opinion was played a big role. His name was Charles E. Flynn. He was a native of DuCoin, and he went to the University of Illinois, graduated up there, and became the sports information director there. Charles E. Chuck Flynn was a personal friend of Don Hayes, and he knew every important media sports type person in the United States. And when the Hayes's were successful in bringing the Hamiltonian here, Don, of course, called Chuck and said, Chuck, you've got to be in charge of our publicity. And Chuck was. Chuck got all of the major uh, publications to, to send representatives here. And I'm talking about the Sports Illustrated, the New York Times, the LA, whatever the hell that is, the LA Times, the Canadian papers. But Chuck was a master at what he did. And he knew these people not 
not professionally, but personally. And yes, then when we took over, Chuck more or less, well, he got old. And, and we took over, and I remember in the press room, we would have, we would have to rent 28 typewriters, just before the days of laptops and personal computers and all that. We rented 28 uh, typewriters, had them all around the, the press room there for the writers coming in. They couldn't carry a typewriter. And then we had two Western Union operators that sat there. The reporters would do their story, do their thing, take their story over to the Western Union operator, and that's how they were dispersed all throughout the United States. But the, the coverage that we had nationally and internationally, I mentioned LA, New York, and everything, but we also had papers from Canada, and of course Miami Herald was here, and the, uh, just every major paper. And it was the PR, the publicity, they had never before been that successful in getting national publicity for the Hamiltonian when it was held in Goshen, New York. Uh, and I'm, I'm not throwing darts at people in no Goshen, New York, I didn't know them. But the, the job that Chuck Flynn did here, and he was the, he hung around for a long, long time. And the, to, to get the people, the, I wish I had my, my check in the sign-in paper or notebook that I had here because there's no one from the, uh, maybe the DuCoin Evening Call was not even, yeah, I'm sure they were here too. But uh, it was the, the PR job that, that was part of it. And of course, the, the track performance that the horses, the winning horses were able to, to post here with the, with the times going down, down, down. The key was getting the, the Grand Circuit here with, with the trouble that they had in Springfield, the, the fairgrounds closing up there, having it down here, and the Hazes taking such excellent care and treated the, the horsemen so well whenever they came here for the first time. They said, why don't we just go back to DuCoin? I'm talking about the Hamiltonian Society members. And it, it took off from there. And do I understand correctly, Jane, that your mother even came up with a song about the Hamiltonian? First year the Hamiltonian came here, my dad said, Leah, we need a song to go with that race. Write a song. She was a right on it and did and sang it every year with Lou Breeze's orchestra, which was the orchestra at night. I want to add, before we go any further, the Hayes family gets a lot of credit, and they do that for this fair, but they didn't do that alone. And the names that come back to all of us who were a part of it all those years are names like Dick Haynes, who was the secretary treasurer, and Bob Green, who took care of that track meticulously after Moody was retired. And Doc Holliday, who was everybody's gopher and saw that everybody was where they were supposed to be when they were supposed to be. And Donkey Walker, who they, everybody said, he's got the keys to everything, but he won't give them to you. He'll just use them for you. And that was true. And then there was Fred Huff. Fred was always the publicist for this fair, as long as I can remember. He wrote about it. He saw to it that a lot of other people wrote about it. He is as integral a part of it as any member of the family. And those people deserve due credit for making this what it is. Everybody who lives in DuCoin has their own set of memories. And I was lying in bed last night thinking, what are my memories? Horse races barbecues, fiddlesticks, corn dogs, and being at a night show seven nights a week. That's my memory of growing up at the DuCoin State Fair. Now, not everybody could be there every night, but if you had a job, you were. And if you looked, lived in the backyard, you were. So it was a very special time for all of DuCoin for all of Southern Illinois, for that well, matter. When you think that this fair in the heydays was bringing in over 300,000 people during the course of the fair to this area, they were coming from really all over the country, in some cases all over the world, uh, to see the Hambletonian, and the quality of the nighttime performers here was incredible. Amazing. 
that you, was before we had Six Flags and all of the other competition that people can go to now. You could television. See it on television. Well, and so we were kind of the only game in town, and we had huge, huge crowds every night. Well, I'm looking at some of the, the performers who have been here. You know, uh, you, you, there's the Everly Brothers, Nat King Cole, Carol Channing, George Burns, Johnny Johnny Carson was here, uh, Andy Griffith, and then later on, you started. Uh, they started booking the country acts. Uh, Carol, your your father Don was very interested in country music and got a lot of the big names here, like Johnny Cash. Tammy Wynette, I remember seeing her here. Willie Nelson, Willie about Nelson. five different times. What uh, what drew them to DuCoin? Why was this a place where Bob Hope and Red Skelton would come and perform? It was before Las Vegas was so big and paid such good money. Uh, they were looking for places to make their name, to become famous. and. This was a pretty good stage and a pretty good crowd and a pretty good way to become known. And, and the people that came for the five nights in a row, they had to stay around here locally. That was and a, they'd be all over town visiting they with people. in people's houses. Yeah, know? being very human and accessible. There were not a lot of motels back in the 40s and 50s. Um, a friend of I, mine and I were in charge of housing. We had little index cards of Mrs. Jones's house has two bedrooms she could rent and she could handle five people. There'd be three in one room, but she could do it. And we would place performers and people who were connected with all the, the midway kinds of things and the vendors. Lots of people in DuCoin rented out rooms in their homes. Absolutely. To people. They were full. I think one of the greatest things was the people that got to keep the chorus girls. You know, we had 30 dancing girls that came to town every year. The Manhattan Rockets. And my, I remember my grandfather saying, if you're going to put on a stage show, you need to fill that stage three times during the night. Fill it. And that's what the dancing girls did three times during the night. They filled it. And he also thought you needed a dog and pony act every year, too. Get some animals up there. Well, it was a variety show. They had so many different acts, all on the same night. Carol, you told me a story about Gentle Ben the Bear getting in one of the, one of the homes Gentle here. Gentle Ben was here at the fair. He came down in our basement. I think he was in your basement, yes, he too. Both of yeah, us. Donnie was the one that led him down the stairs at our house. I don't know who brought him down to yours, but His he was well, very well behaved and was a nice person that night. He drank <laughs> Coca-Cola, so he was first class. We also had Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion, and I was nine months pregnant with our oldest son, Trent, and sat right next to him on the ground. And I know, I remember the handler that had him said, now this is a lion, you know. Of course, being young and stupid as I was then, I said, oh, he'll be fine. I sat there, and, and, and he was. He was very well behaved. Wow. Fred, you told me a story about negotiating for Red Skelton to come here and headline, and you got him at a really good price. Yeah, Red had been here. He knew what the DuCoin State Fair was, and he knew how nice the people here in Southern Illinois treated him. And so one year, uh, we, by we, the Mr. Haynes, young Haynes, Bill, and somebody I can't recall the other guy, we decided to have, to ask Red Skelton back again. And I said, you know, I, I don't know why, but I have Red Skelton's name in my, my pad, my book, and there's a telephone number there. I have no idea what it is. If we want Red, why, well, I'll call him. So Bill agreed to offer him as go as high as $40,000. And so I pick up the phone, I dialed the number, and the voice on the end said, hello. And I said, uh, I'm calling for Red Skelton's home. He said, this is Red. And we conversed and talked about him coming. He said, I'd love to come back to DuCoin again. It's a wonderful place. And we agreed on the date. And finally got down and said, Red, we agreed on everything, but how about the price? What are you asking? What are you getting for a one-night performance these days? He said, 
Oh, I don't know how much you got. And I said, well, of course, I'm always trying to make impression on my boss, Bill. And then I said, um, how does $20,000 sound to you? And he said, sounds good to me. We got Red Skelton for $20,000. That was in 1977, his last year here. He came in four nights before he appeared on the stage. And we, we, yeah, we had to put him up in the plastic house, which is over here on the north side of the fairgrounds. And he, all he did was visit people in DuCoin, people in Southern Illinois, walk the Midway, sign autographs for kids, and be nice to people. He's one of the finest men I've ever known in my life. And I think he was typical of country music performers, and I'm not knocking it, those are in pop or anything, but Don Hayes was the first to bring country music artists to the DeCoin State Fair. He did that in 1965, I think, following Gene's death, and he said, why don't we give that a try? And it was so successful that it became, it became a, well, one of the key pieces, one of the key nights of, of entertainment on the stage here. Not that we didn't have the other entertainers too, but the country music artists were really, key. I don't know how many times Johnny Cash has been here. I don't know how many times Willie Nelson has been here. Um, uh, the guy that plays the guitar, uh, Jim Clark, uh, what's his name? Roy Clark. Roy Clark, yeah. He's been here 12 times, 12 times. And people still enjoy it's just, a, it's a reputation. It's a reputation that this fair has. People in, throughout Southern Illinois know that if they go to see the DuCoin State Fair and I shows, their chances are they're going to see a wonderful show and one that they're going to enjoy. It's reputation. It's something that the DuCoin State Fair excels in. Jane tells a story that I find really interesting. You got to know Bob Hope and one night he was a little short on having enough people to uh, do a, was it a fashion show or what was, the, what, what was the context? I think it was the first time he came. He's been here four times, but the first, he was doing a Labor Day show and my dad came up in the box to me on Sunday night and he said, I just had a call from Bob Hope's manager. He wants 10 girls on stage tomorrow night to model for him. Get 90 of your friends and get ready to go. Next day was Labor Day. Wyman Style Shop opened up so those girls could get in there and find something appropriate to wear. And we all did it. And he was, you know, he's, he's funny. That's who he is, he's funny. But he was not unkind, he was not demeaning. I remember exactly what he did to me. When I walked off the stage, I disappeared. He shouted, Jane, Jane, come back. So I come back and look at him and he goes, bye. That's all. You know, everybody laughed. But there was nothing ugly about that. He was gentle. I didn't, did the same thing for him at a style show in Champaign where I was going to school and he remembered me. One of my happiest memories is when Illinois went to the Rose Bowl in 52 and won. I'm walking out of the stadium and right coming at me I say oh, Mr. Hope and he said Jane Hayes Ducoin how are you this is my friend um, oh shoot who was it one J Jerry Colonna it's my daughter Linda we're on our way to collect from Crosby he beat on, he uh, bet on Stanford I had the Illini and again remembered me when we walked away, my roommate from college was standing next to me and she said, hmm, thanks a lot for introducing me. Of course, I hadn't. Fast forward many years, Bob Hope is doing a show in Champaign, Illinois, and they're gonna introduce him at halftime. I happen to be head of the Alumni Association, so I was gonna introduce him and my old roommate was there. I said, Joanne, you're going down on that football field with me, and if nothing else happens today, you are going to meet Bob Hope. And she did, and he was very kind to her. That night at his show in the arena in Champaign, he said, how many of you have been to the Coin State Fair? Well, 
number of hands went up. He said, well, the rest of you have missed a great, great place to be. Get down there this year. So that's the kind of friend of the fair he was. He came often. He loved it. He remembered it. And, and I was always astonished that he would remember my name. How many people does he meet in a day, much less a year and many years? Amazing person. But that tells you what the Ducoin State Fair meant to those people. It was a good memory. Jack, talking about entertainers, I've, I've got to mention one name which has not yet been mentioned here. A guy by the name of George Kirby. Oh, yes. Remember him George well. Kirby, no one in the world, certainly not, no one in Southern Illinois had ever, had ever heard of George Kirby. He was an opening act for the night Johnny Carson was to be, was the headliner. He came out and did his thing. The fans, we had, of course, people throwing the, the grandstand to see um, uh, Johnny Carson. Kirby hadn't attracted anybody. Kirby did his thing. The fans would not let him leave the stage. They brought him back with a standing ovation. He went through another five or 10 minutes tried to get off the stage. Again, they came up with a standing ovation. He came back to three standing ovations. He did everything. He played instruments, he told stories, he sang. He was the finest entertainer. This is a stupid thing for me to say, but he's the finest entertainer I think I've ever seen. And he finally, Johnny Carson was standing in the wings watching him in the last, his third encore. And he finally got Kirby off stage. He went down in the, and I happened to be with Don Hayes. We went in his dressing room after he got down there. And he, the man was sitting there crying. I mean, crying, crying. He said, I, I've never, I've never, never been treated like that before in my life. I love this place. He came back the next two years. He was here three years. Every year he came back. He went to Menard Prison and put on a show for the prisoners over there. He did this. The fair management had nothing to do with arranging or anything. George Kirby did that on his own. And Carson, Johnny came out. He went through his monologue there and everything, and it was good. But, you know, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't capture the crowd. And he realized that. And after about 30 minutes, he said, folks, you, you, you've had the wonderful opportunity of seeing one of the finest entertainers I've ever seen before in my life. I don't know who this guy is. I've never heard of him before. But he's already done a tremendous job. I'm going through my thing. And, you know, it's getting a little bit late. If it's OK with you, I, let's just call tonight. He got a very polite applause. No one booed for his short appearance, 30 minutes, not much more. But Kirby came back every year, and I, I just had to mention George's name. Uh, George Kirby, greatest entertainer that ever appeared here, and there have been some great ones. And there were unusual things that happened, too, at the fair. Carol, you told me that one night there was a knock on the door. They were trying to find a missing alligator. <laughs> yes. Uh gentleman knocked on the door. I answered the door and he said, ma'am, would you mind if I looked in your swimming pool? And I kind of hesitated and I said, well, and he said, ma'am, we're missing our alligator in the carnival grounds and we'd like to look in your pool. And I said, yes, by all means, please go look in the pool. And he did. It wasn't there. There's a chain link fence between the pool and the carnival grounds that's all grown over with brush. He was hiding in there on this side. He was trying to get to it, but he couldn't get through the chain link fence. So I was very glad when he found him on that side of the fence. The other thing we were recalling today as we're all sitting here, it's a little warm. In those days, those houses were not air conditioned. Nothing was air conditioned. And oh my, did it get hot down in the basement with 50 people. Um, that's where all the horse people came after the races and um, they would leave dripping press people. wet. <laughs> it was, yeah, horse people, press people, entertainers. Lou Breeze and his piano player came over every night after the show and played and sang for us. And um, it was hot. 
It was hot upstairs, it, but you all know that. Everybody's house was hot in those days. You just lived with it, you see, and we're not used to it anymore. We're used to being cool when we go in a place. Um, I think about that, and even when we had the outside parties, it was hot some nights, but everybody was sort of used to it, you know? We were, we were a little tougher then than we are now, I think. One of the fun things I remember growing up out here is I got extra perks besides getting to meet all the entertainers. They used to give helicopter rides over in the infield of the half mile track. And I, of course, I was all over the place during the fair and I got to talk to those guys and visit with them. And on a real slow day, they would take me up for a ride. We'd go uptown and I'd find my friends' houses where they live and hover, I mean, right over the roofs. And everybody in the neighborhood came out, including my friend, and we'd all wave. And then whenever they'd come back to the fairgrounds, they'd run right over the water on the long cut, the longest lake up here. And it looked like you're gonna run right into all those trees, and then he'd just pop up over them. It was the best ride out here. And I got to enjoy that, it was fun. I took my first and only helicopter ride out there. Did you? I loved it. So yeah. did I. I'm not <laughs> sure I've had one before or since, the one I t took here. Well, um, another perk we had, Carol, we got passes to the rides, too. Yes, we did. You know, when your dad's the manager, they kind of hand those out, and they were kept in a drawer in our house, and we'd go open that drawer when we needed to. I got in trouble another night when the show was going on at the grandstand and it was time for a men's quartet called the White Guards to appear. My dad was there and he called for the White Guards. They didn't appear. My friend and I had him on the Ferris wheel at that very <laughs> moment, just having a big time, going round and round and round. I heard about that from my dad too and I didn't ever do that again, no. I got to go around the carnival, all of the different stands with all the stuffed animals, and I got to pick out one stuffed animal that I wanted, and the last day of the fair, they'd give it to me. Well, I always picked out the biggest one. After years, I had a huge collection of giant stuffed animals. I don't even know what ever happened to all of them. Now, of course, uh, the state of Illinois ended up uh, buying the fair in 1986. And uh, we're now, I guess, are we the only state that has two state fairs? I, I thought at one time California might have had two, but it's quite a distinction for a state like Illinois to have the one event, of course, in Springfield, and then come down to DuCoin for something with a slightly different uh, hometown flavor to it. My grandfather just named it that. It, it wasn't a state designation, it was an owner naming and he wanted it to be equal to that fair in Springfield, and he wanted it to be prominent, so he felt it should have a prominent name. Yeah, Grandpa and, Hayes is the one that started calling it the State Fair. That's, and it stuck. And it, and it endures till today. And we're in the 96th edition of the fair, and you told me once, you only missed one. Uh, I missed one in my 85 years. We were living in California. And I had a child that Labor Day, so I was not at the fair, but it's the only one I've missed. Another memory that came back to me, I read periodically the wonderful, wonderful tribute that was given to our grandfather when he died. He was 75 years old. It was in October, right after the fair. And Paul Hibbs, a name known to DuCoin people because he was head of the speech department at our high school for many years, and a really respected gentleman. He gave a fine eulogy to our grandfather, but I was reading it the other night, and the phrase that came across, and I wrote it down, was he referred to him as an uncommonly common man. And he was. He was large of stature, but he was warm and friendly and was everybody's friend. He was an uncommonly common man. We've talked to him about a lot of things, entertainers and horse racing. We haven't yet to mention auto racing. Uh, 
I'm Auto racing was up. a major, major, yeah, major portion of the success of the Decoin State Fair. And just to, to give you an example of the big time names who raced here successfully, I'll tell the one story, one story only on A.J. Foyt. A.J. Foyt was one of the most popular, well-known auto race drivers in, in the nation back in the years in the 60s. A.J. Foyt came here and he won the championship race in 1960, 1961. This 1962 race was rained out, was not held at DuCoin. He won the, the major race, a 100 miler in 1963, and again in 1964. It so happens, it so happens that A.J. Foyt won four, not five, not three, but he won four national championships, driving championships. They coincided with the four years he won at DuCoin, 1960, 61, 63, and 64. A.J. Foyt is one of the finest, and he was one of the most popular drivers ever to race here, and there have been many of them. Well, I've seen other big names like Tony Bettenhausen, uh, Mario Andretti. Why did the car racers love the Magic Mile? It was a fast track. And th there have been modifications to that track at their request, like the fence you see across there now, that didn't used to be there, but that's a requirement. So if there's an accident, they don't fly into the crowd. Uh, and the bumpers on the railing of the track are mandated by car racing. But all the big names were here, and, and they still have good car racing. You know, and the affair is a fair. There were exhibits all over, um, first in the grandstand, and then when paramutual betting moved in there, it had to be moved to the exhibition building, but the cakes and the cookies and the preserves and the Afghans and the artwork have been a part of the fair from the very beginning, and the corn and the tomatoes and the and, things we grow. And the livestock judging. And the livestock, the hogs and the cattle were, and they still are, they're over there, and they have their judging and their day uh, in the ring. It was a multifaceted, still is. I would just like to say that I, for one, am grateful to the state of Illinois for buying this fair, because if they hadn't, it would not be here. It simply became impossible for private ownership to uh, afford it and they couldn't, and um, I'm forever grateful to Governor Thompson for doing that. As we come to the end of our hour here, I'd like for each of you to reflect a little bit about what you hope, what the fair has meant to you personally, and what you hope uh, future generations take away from this magnificent uh, facility and all the memories here. Well, it's like anything else. If it's here, people will come. Our goal all the years our family had it was to make it bigger and better every year. And that, I, that attempt still goes on and managers like Norm Hill did their utmost to make that happen. It's increasingly difficult. And there are lots of obstacles, money being the big one. <laughs> State of Illinois doesn't have money to give the DuCoin Fair to paint and fix up, unfortunately. So those kinds of problems persist and tastes change. One of the reasons we don't have big names anymore is they can get so much money at Las Vegas, they don't need to come to DuCoin. And at one point, they did need to come to DuCoin. So um, everything changes. It's not the fair we grew up with. No, it isn't. And, um, I'm just grateful it's still here and it's still a fair and it still has meaning for the people who do come and enjoy it. Um, we were blessed to have been here from almost the beginning and to have been a part of it. And you don't get over it. Today's the first day I've been here this year and when I drive through that gate, I get a lump in my throat. It's, it's coming back to a big part of my heritage and I'm happy, happy to be here. Thanks, Jack. Carol? Thank you, Jack, for having us and doing this. It's so nice that people still remember our Hayes family. Jane and I are the only two left. 
and the rest of them have been gone a long, long time, and we're not getting any younger, Jane. Yeah, afraid so. Uh, I'm still, I'm glad that the fair's still going on also. I wish it could grow. I wish the state could give more money so we could do more things, more repairs, have bigger name acts. I don't think it's gonna happen, but as long as it keeps going and they keep the doors open, I'll be happy. Thank you. Fred, you get the last word. Last word is, Thank you, Jack, for the effort that you've made. And I know it's been a heck of an effort. It's not easy putting on a show like this. And, and all of us here, Jane, Carol, myself, certainly appreciate your, your interest and willingness as well as the universities. Because without the university, and I know they've got some problems too, just like a lot of us, but we're going to make it. We're going to make it. I think I... I personally think the Ducoin State Fair is here forever, and I certainly hope that it will be. As I hope that SIU's enrollment increases by thousands next year, and I hope Coach Henson and Coach Hill both have successful seasons because that's important. Thank you all very much, and thank you all for coming. Thanks to our great crew from WSIU uh, and here at the State Fair. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Enjoy the fair.